On, uh, on behalf of the New England Hymns chapter, I want to welcome everybody here. This is the third year we've done this. Um, if you've been coming to the last couple of events, you recognize we've got a new location, a little bit bigger, because some people got turned away last year. Um, I think it's a testament to the, the program and, and to all of you for wanting to come to these events every year. A uh, couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. Um, please visit our sponsors. Uh, they're part of what makes this happen and, and funds this event. This, this again, is uh, free for all of the members of New England Hymns. Uh, a couple of people I want to thank, and I'm probably going to keep thanking them all day today, um, starting with Kathy Bruno. Uh, last winter, I came up and visited Kathy, and I said, you know, we've been doing this event for a couple of years in the Bangor area, and it's in your backyard and it's free for all of your staff, wouldn't it be, you know, how about uh, loaning me a couple of people to help pull this event together and deal with the logistics? And uh, she, get, she assigned Diane Meacham and Jim Belanger, and i got to tell you, these have been some of the best people to work with. It has been fantastic. So, a uh, little bit of housekeeping. Restrooms are outside and to the left. The breakout sections today for technology, there'll be one with uh, Central Maine on outsourcing uh, systems, and there'll be one with uh, AirWatch. Those are in the room out to the left as well. We have applied for CPUs, for CP hymns, for those who are interested. I got the paperwork in just under the wire, so I should be getting the certificate in the next week or so. And when I do, I'll email that out to everybody who left an email address when they registered. And one more thing, the <coughs> sessions are being videotaped, and we will be loading those on the New England Hymns um, YouTube channel. So if you're torn between going to see Blake or coming in here to see Deb Culver, don't worry, you'll be able to catch catch the act and a replay later. Um, I did bring my puppets today. <laughs> and we have evaluation forms, and uh, before you leave today, it would be we'd be grateful if you'd uh, drop those off with us. So I want to uh, kick this off and welcome uh, Tariq uh, uh, Abu Jabbar. Sorry, uh, I had the pleasure of seeing uh, Tariq give this presentation on one very similar um, in November, I believe it was. And it was such a great presentation on informatics that uh, he actually was named the Speaker of the Year for New England Hymns. It was one of the best sessions that we'd had. I was honored when I got to see him in December to corner him and ask him if he would be our keynote today. He is the uh, Vice President of Informatics at Harvard Pilgrim. He has a storied history in this field, and uh, so I want to welcome him uh, as our keynote speaker. Thank you. A storied history. I like that. Checkered history. <laughs> um, you all can hear very well? Yeah. Um, so I figure any place that needs a just catering is the place I'll show up. <laughs> that was class. <classic>. Um, <laughs> And, um, all right, so the, the, to, to, to frame the conversation, oh, and first of all, by the way, I did not bring puppets, so Deb's presentation is definitely going to be better. Um, also, in, in terms of competition, I, my guess is there might be other things, like the, the talking dog with the bacon on YouTube. It's probably more entertaining than this, but this will be a close second. No, there's a new one, by the way, if you haven't seen it. Um, so, like probably many of you, I've been in healthcare forever and um, have watched this evolution, uh, many evolutions, many sort of contempt, you know, parallel evolutions. And, and IT certainly had, has been a huge one. Uh, you know, we used this, uh, I remember the first little business I, I ran, a little consulting group in the late, mid, late 80s. And uh, we were so pleased when we could um, run a, a mailing list. And we'd, we'd get it going at 5 o'clock in the afternoon by lunch the next day. We'd have 100,000 mailing labels. That was just so awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we, I always try to remember things like that because we get so spoiled. And um, 
And yet, it's good to be spoiled. I want to be spoiled because now we're looking at things like integrating administrative and clinical data in the same place across all patients, across all providers, across an entire geographic region. And, and I think it's completely appropriate to be really irritated that it's not easy. Even though people look at you, you're out of your mind. How in the world are you going to do that? Or especially as a healthcare payer. You, know, you, just, you, 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 have, you, you just can't worry about what's possible. And, and I think healthcare is a great example of that. Um, most of the stuff we're doing today wasn't possible a, a very short time ago. So, so I'm in this, this made up field called informatics, which I really enjoy a lot. And um, in fact, when I started, there was no such word. So I actually got to watch the word evolve. Um, <laughs> It's kind of fun. And made up words are great because they can mean literally anything you want them to. And I have a slide on that. And it comes in very handy when, when my performance evaluation comes around. I did exactly what the informaticist was supposed to do, right? Um, but the really nice thing, I, the thing I like is I'm actually not in IT. I never have been. In fact, I left an organization once because they tried to move my group into IT. Um, we, are, we, we sit right on that border. That's what's, what I find really interesting. We're in, you know, some, and, and I work in different organizations. Sometimes informatics is an idea, sometimes it's in, in business. But the key thing is it's right on that kind of razor edge. Because don't you all find, I know I'm told a lot of you folks are IT professionals, um, that, that there's a, it's almost like a simultaneous translation problem. You're, you're saying something that makes perfect sense to you, and the physicians or the, the nurses or the administrators are saying something that makes perfect sense to them. And you're looking at each other like, that ain't English. What are you talking about? No, no, no. I, I just told you that. It, and so that that's, informatics tries to sit in the middle there. And so we, we essentially translate business requirements into technical requirements and, and the other way around. Or, or even more simply, you know, what's really fun about what I do is I sit there and go, wow, look at the stuff, the hugely important stuff that just isn't happening here. Um, and why is that? And, and, there's, and is there an information route to that? Uh, R-O-O-T. And usually there is, because I guess that, that at, the, at the end of this presentation, if I could leave you with one thesis, ooh, there's a grandiose one. Um, <coughs> at the end of the day, and I'll say this to anybody who cares, um, if you strip away everything that an insurer, and after all, health plans an insurer, everything that a health plan does that we have to do, the stuff that we shouldn't or couldn't really hand off to anybody else, you're really only left I think, the two functions. One is actuarial, of course, the insurance function, and the other is information. And that's about it, really. I mean, we have all these clinical functions because no one else does them and because we all collectively set up this insane system where physicians aren't actually, health systems aren't paid to do population health, so somebody had to do that. Um, but really, at the end of the day, it's not, that's, not a, that's not the core of what a health plan slash insurer is. So uh, my, my thesis for the morning is, it's, it's, it's so much of this of what we're trying to accomplish in healthcare you know, is about information. And it even works. Technology, I was just gonna <coughs> say, the first time I ever took one of these things out, I was, you know, it's like, you know, you see, the, you can always tell the young consultants, and forgive me, those of you who are young consultants, I don't mean to embarrass somebody in the audience, but they're, yeah, their hair always looks so good. <laughs> you see these guys at the airport, and it's like, you can see the comb marks. Like, Damn, how do you do that? So I never had that, but I was a, I was a young consultant once. And um, these things were, I remember, $125 a day. That was a lot of money, right? I mean, that was like my fee. Um, and, and you had to rent them from places that were across town. So, you know, you'd go out at 5.05, because they charge you by the day, the day before. And, then, and you'd rent the thing, and you'd be at the airport, you'd fly wherever you had to go, and you'd get there, and the bulb didn't work. Mm -hmm. So we, we've overcome a few hurdles. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what I want to go through is just um, probably stuff, and, and, and by the way, please make this interactive. I get sick of my own voice, and you probably do too. So and it's, it's too early in the morning to listen to a, a monotone. So just throw questions in. Uh, you know, if I'm like looking this way and you're over there, just shout. Um, keep, keep it live. Uh, but I, so my idea is to go through, you know, why, why is informatics, why is information an important, not just tactical, but strategic asset? There's a big difference there, I think an important one. What well, Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare is, is up to, in, in case you care, this is an important market um, for us. Um, 
and then because largely you all are, are yourselves or represent or work with provider organizations, um, I, I particularly want to focus on, on that key linkage and, and why it's really different than it was even just a couple of years ago, or at least it is for us. I'm going to go through some examples. I actually have some cute little demo kind of things that hopefully work, um, and then we can wrap it up. So, Here's my made up word again. So I figured you deserve a, a, a micro history of what, how, why this, this word even got made up. Um, because certainly, I've been in three health, health plans, healthcare organizations that were just starting informatics departments and I got to be part of those. And um, uh, there is the predictable resentment. We are to do reporting, who is this guy? And, and they have a point, kind of. Um, because every health plan, every insurance company, every hospital, every physician office, I mean, certainly every insurance company, every health plan, does a ton of reporting. I mean, you've got, you've got spreadsheets falling out the windows. And, um, you know, we're in, it's, it's 99, or as my father used to say, nine out of six of the reports are financial. Um, <laughs> it was great. He was a professor, and I used to love that I cut school to go listen to his lectures. He'd say things like that, and he'd look around and see who wrote it down. <laughs> <laughs> had a professor, I was at Cornell a thousand years ago, and, and we had this guest lecturer from England, and the guy was really glib and funny and brilliant, and you know, it wasn't going to be on the test. You know, these guys from England, right? And so he's going on, he's telling all these great anecdotes, everybody's feverishly taking notes. And, and at one point, he just got pissed off, and he looked up and he said, you know, I've, I've been told if you tell a joke at Harvard, they laugh. <laughs> tell the same joke at Yale, they smile. But if you tell it at Cornell, they write it down. <laughs> and 300 kids went. <laughs> 300 minus one, I was not taking notes. Um, so, there, so we've got all this reporting, and reporting is great. It summarizes data, it tells you kind of like where the, where the money's going. Um, and, and particularly, we really focus on self-funded accounts because, you know, sort of legally and morally, they, they own the data, the, the information is theirs, they deserve to have it. And that information is great, and it's retrospective, and it tells you where the money went, essentially, and if you're kind of on track, if you're, if you're losing money, if you're making money. It, it tends to be very summary. Terribly important stuff, can't live without it. But it doesn't exactly drive decision-making. It doesn't actually tell you what to do next. What if things are going south, right? Then what? So we all started hiring analysts, and um, and that's great. Uh, so and and an, the job of a good analyst, presumably, is to do something with it, make sense of it, to to put a couple of bullet points at the bottom of the spreadsheet that says, and therefore, right? Um, and and yet it was kind of goofy, and, and I this this wonder if this is actually a a a an, acu an actual example. A good friend of mine, this absolutely brilliant, wonderful uh, fellow. He was our medical director um, uh, when I was with a, actually with a vendor uh, in the in the early knots. Met the word for the 2000s knots. Um, and uh, he tells a story when he was first medical director at a very small local health plan, um, and uh, the, the analyst came up and said, "You know, Dr. Burt, this medical group over here, they're 25 cents p.m. p.m. over budget. Go talk to them. Go do something about it." So you know, Don puts his best suit on and he goes out and says, you know, Dr. XYZ, you're 25 cents a PM, PM over budget. And it is a true story. The guy just stood there and looked at him and pulled a quarter, literally pulled a quarter out of his pocket, threw it at him right in the forehead. Now we're even. Get the hell out of my office. And, and that's exactly how much that meant to him. Nothing. So Don kind of came back to the office and scratched his head and said, what went wrong? So he had the right information, kind of, at the wrong level, and, and he had no, nothing behind it. Um, so we, we, you know, we kept kind of devising stuff, and, and there's a lot of good stuff out there. I, I mentioned kind of some of these, these alphabet soup um, groupers, for example. For, you know, we had, the DRGs were great. They, they said, okay, everything that happens at the hospital around a cabbage or a knee replacement or, you know, an atrial fib or whatever it is, that, that, that's, that's kind of interesting. We got, I got to work with some of those folks. And then some of those same people then thought, well, what about, what if we start looking at the risk of a patient over time? 
depending on the diagnoses you have. And that was the, the origin of the, the DCG's diagnostic um, risk grouper that's used by Medicare and now lots of other people. And they have their own they have competitors. I don't mean to advocate for any one vendor. Um, and then we said, well, what about, what about everything that happens to a patient over time to treat a, a disease or a condition or a surgery? And then the notion of an episode of care came up, and that became really interesting. Um, so it's all kind of interesting, but it's all a little bit disorganized. Um, we had Dr. Weinberg up over at Dartmouth, you know, who, who, who taught us all about a variation, and that really, that in the early 90s, that really started to stir things up. And, and now we're looking at some really interesting things around the, around value because it's all about value. And, and uh, you know, we can't. I was just saying to Deb this morning, we 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 can't do as a health and we can't do anything anymore. I mean, anything internally or externally if we can't demonstrate why it matters. There's no more. This looks cool. That just doesn't do it anymore. Um, I got to go to my CFO and explain why this thing that looks cool is going to add value somewhere for somebody in a tangible, measurable way. And I got to go back six months later and prove to him I wasn't making it up. Whether it's going to make our accounts more successful, our providers more successful, or ourselves more successful, or the new one that I'm really excited about, believe it or not, no one ever thought about this two years ago, consumers, right? Because we used to just sell the groups. Individual is a big thing now. But we, health plans are making an incredibly awkward transition. Remember your kids, and they were learning to walk, very similar. Um, from B2B, because that's what we are, we're a B2B business, not anymore, we're going to be a B2C business. And that, there's about three people in our building who have the slightest notion of what that means. So it's really, I, I used to teach sixth grade briefly, I was very bad at it actually, but um, <laughs> the kids scared the hell out of me. Sixth grade, remember sixth grade, like you're from another planet, okay? or you ought to be. And, um, that's one kid he used to go out in the parking lot like the air out of my tires every two days. And he was a really nice kid. That's the weird thing. He was one of my brighter students. He was not a discipline problem. I'd say, Robbie, what are you doing, man? And I'd say, oh, it's really funny. Say, but see, it's not. <laughs> You're not getting any business at all. You're going to get in all kinds of trouble. You really inconvenience me. <laughs> and then a week later, you have to doing it again. Sixth grade, it's just wonderful. But the reason I bring that up is, um, why did I bring that up? <laughs> you know, it's gone now. You know, you get over 50. Anyway, um, it'll come back eventually. <laughs> oh, right, because the only time I noticed they ever learned anything is when they were confused. When they looked comfortable, nothing was happening. So I would throw the most ludicrous stuff at them sometimes. Just they go, what? And then their minds would open up. So in a sense, like moving into consumerism is really shaking us up as health plans. And it's great, because I can see my own colleagues going, well, I mean, I suppose we could do this crazy thing that we've always just sort of, you know, out of hand, not really thought of. Well, yeah, let's. Let's do silly things that might just work. So what about, but particularly, what about our relationship with providers? Now this, this gets really juicy because, you know, first of all, we, all payments were fee for service. You did one, you got paid for it. So it's you know, very much like going into the, the hardware store, like two of those and six of those. And, um, the other, and on, on, on the provider side, you all tell me if I'm wrong, but, um, and I've, I've worked for, for provider organizations as well. We, and when I was, like, it's like we, um, we measured our own success against what well, we just assumed that everything in the shop was a fixed cost, right? We, well, we got these 12 doctors, and we got this building, and we got you know this equipment and this stuff, and so it costs that. And I want to make this much this year, so that's a fixed cost, and so that's what it costs to run the practice. And, and, and health plans were doing the same thing. And again, nobody, people were really fixed in their minds about exactly what it took to get the work done. Um, so, so again, it's a very, very um, inflexible kind of environment, and and I think of it, frankly, as kind of an arms race. You know, um, I, I was with Anthem, WellPoint, Anthem, actually WellPoint before it merged with Anthem many years ago, and out in California, they have a lot of uh, they have a lot of ca uh, capitation, you know, prepaid uh, uh, contracts, and they go out to the groups every year, and, th and this just still blows my mind. I mean, you think. California, pretty smart out there. They've been doing this for a long time. Blue Cross California, big, huge, successful organization. And they go out to the doctor with these enormous physician groups, I mean, tens of thousands, literally, of providers in these groups. They're very dominant monopolies. And um, they go out with no data, 
about what actually happened last year, and the docs have come to the table with no data about what it actually cost them to provide care that year, or what they did, and they just sit across the table and go, we need a 14% increase. Well, we're only going to get 8%. And then they do this for a while, they sue each other, and then eventually they agree on 10, and then they... And, and, and the year I joined them, in 2005, I think it was, and this is actually a remarkable thing. Think about it for a second. PPO, which is fee for service, and you have all the data, your little data warehouse, and HMO, which in California, like I'm telling you, I'm giving trade secrets here, but they fixed it since then. Um, it, they weren't collecting any data, so they had absolutely no idea what the HMO um, patients were getting or the docs were doing. The HMO actually passed the PPO in terms of uh, PMPM -PM cost. The HMO patients cost, were, they were paying more for HMO than for PPO, which is a completely mind-blowing thing. It, it completely defies the whole point of why they had HMO prepaid capitated product. It was supposed to be about controlling costs, shifting risk to the providers. Since they just sat across the table and argued over their percent increase with no data behind it, that was the inevitable outcome. So, in the early 90s, this is exactly what they did and what many of us did, we all sort of said, okay, I got an idea. Since the costs are getting out of hand, let's just wing 100 bucks PM, PM over the wall at y'all and, and, and do your thing and it'll be great, right? And then we're out of it and you have all the risk and everybody's happy. And we come back six months later and there's a closed sign on the door. What's that about? Doctors can't go out of business. Well, yeah, they can. I mean, Health South is a memory none of us should ever forget. Um, it, but there was this, this, this absolute, what, what happened? How can that happen? Uh, and, and, and again, back to my thesis, remember at the beginning? Every once in a while, I actually tie my thoughts together. Um, it's all about information. The docs had no information, and the health plans weren't helping them out. Really. So the docs didn't know why they went out of business either, because Every physician provides the world's best medicine, right? There's, and I say that with only a trace of irony. Um, because in, unless you, I mean, th think, I'll, I'll go back to teaching. As a teacher, I thought I was teaching well. My kids did well. They liked me. They got good grades. But if somebody came along and said, we actually measure this stuff, and it's not going well, you know, teacher obviously. If that's all you said to me, I'd say, Okay, I'm doing exactly what I know to do. If you don't tell me what I'm doing wrong, what I ought to do differently to get a different outcome, I'm helpless. And that's, that's pretty much exactly where they were. So where you might notice we're all heading back into risk contracting aggressively and interestingly and differently, and I hope better, is that actually you folks are approaching us payer folks and asking for it. And that's cool, that's different, that didn't happen before. So I hope that means that there is a general um, uh, better infrastructure to, to handle it. But, but we feel, as, as a health plan, uh, a, a business and, and just a, oh, morals too high for the word, but a, a um, just right, to, we owe you the data, the information, so they, that doesn't happen again. And there's no reason we, we shouldn't provide that. So that's why this time <coughs> might be different. Might. Why, so why does it matter? And, and the whole point is to add value. The whole point of informatics, the whole point of information and information sharing is to add value. Is to say, is to go back to the teaching example. Well, dummy, the reason you're a lousy teacher is because you, you, know, you give the wrong homework and your tests are poorly written and you know, blah, blah, blah. Like give the person some guidance um, or um, uh, the reason health uh, system, you know, ABC, um, okay, go back to my own consulting days. We, we, I was working with um, a, a large integrated practice in of all wonderful, actually incredibly charming places, Wichita, Kansas, um, where the, the, at the time, 15, 20 years ago, the department stores really, or not department, um, hardware stores really did have um, um, a sawdust sprinkled on the floor. I just love that. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. Um, and, and they couldn't understand why they were in the red month after month after year after year. And, and it, you know, it, in a funny sort of way, it wasn't that hard. We, but they didn't, have, they, they didn't have any information. They had decent clinical information in paper, in envelopes, but they could get to it. And, and the health plans they worked with had okay information about the claims that they were being paid, but there was nothing that put those two things together. And, and, and we pointed out some, some pretty high-level stuff. I mean, again, this is the mid-90s. There's no rocket science here. 
We said, gee, you know, every patient who walks through the door, and I think this was pretty much literally true, got a, got a series of x-rays or other kinds of imaging. You know, that costs money. They're like, yeah, but you pay for it. Yeah, but you see, you, you don't get paid a lot for it, and it really costs you a lot to maintain those, you know, and the technology and the, the technicians. And they had no idea. They had no idea they were losing money on what they thought was a big revenue driver. So my thesis, again, is information matters a lot in any healthcare organization, payer or provider. Because if you don't know, if you don't, if you don't have information to drive decision making, you're guessing. You're just guessing. Um, and, and then you know, going like this. It works. Um, so informatics is all about improving the quality, the usefulness of the information. Not just shoveling more junk. I can shovel junk all day. I have a garden for that. Um, but, but shoveling maybe less but better. You know, very targeted stuff. So it's, it, it's, it's not, you know, we, anything comes out of my shop, I try to have nothing that's just a bunch of data, or information, or whatever, spreadsheet, but it should always have something written down somewhere that says, and therefore, what this means is, action you should take based on this might be. <coughs> I'm going way too slow, aren't I? I'll, I'll pick it up, pick it up great deal, actually. Um, so this, this slide is just sort of funny because I've worked with a lot of different health plans and, and this notion of an informatics department ranges from like three smart people in the closet, you know, if you make the door open, you go, like, how do you do ROI again? Oh yeah, okay. You know, um, to another, I worked in another organization where everybody who had any analytic function at all got like yanked and, and dropped into this, what became this behemoth of a department. Everybody hated them, resented them for taking away their analysts. And the next morning, all the medical directors went and hired another analyst. So that didn't work. So Harvard Pilgrim's trying to kind of shoot down the middle. I'm a, I only have a 17 person crew and that serves our, our entire you know, uh, business across New England, all the products and everything. Um, and we focus on everything. Um, so you know, you kind of can divide up the health plan into four big chunks, um, finance, actuarial, you know, kind of the, the nitty gritty financial underpinnings of it. And they're all about information, right? Um, I mean, and, and, and they look back and explain why, but they got to look forward and predict the future, too. And, and, you know, from all this ROI stuff, predictive modeling and all that good stuff, um, the, the Society of Actuaries came out with a paper in uh, this ancient history, now 2001 or two, and it's still, everybody quotes it because it's so funny. Um, and and they, they looked at the models that actuary underwriters have used forever and ever and ever to predict future costs, which is age sex adjustment, right? Well, it turns out that if you look at, if you look at like two people um, and you predict their costs using just age sex adjustment, the age sex adjustment itself accurately predicts about 2% of the variation between them in the future. So in other words, what really happens, you, you picked up about 2% of it through an age sex adjustment. Like, wow, yeah, right, technology. Um, um, wow, now, and on the other hand, um, only about 46, 48% of future risk is predictable, unless you're God, or you have this awesome crystal ball or something. Because that's getting hit by a bus and falling down a well and stuff like that, and you can't predict that. But there's a big different distance between two and 48, you know? And, and that, that is one of the things that we've, we've tried to fill through some of these we just talked about predictive models this morning, and they're getting better all the time. But you know, just keep in mind, there's a ceiling up there. And there's also a silly point. There's that, the, that point where the curve flattens out. You're going, oh, wow, our model you know, predicts 28%. And yours only 27%. No, 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 no. Who cares? You know? I mean, it makes no, it's about what you do with it. Not, not, not the, the predictive power is kind of a, a vaguely interesting thing, but knowing what to do with the information is a lot more interesting. Um, and that, that gets all into the clinical informatics. So there, there's our. Our, um, our disease management, case management, and you know they got like a few, not too many nurses, and that's not a lot of time. We got a, we've got a million members, and we're trying to figure out who are the 300 people who had who really would benefit from having a nurse call them up and say, "Can I help you?" Right? And you target the nurses at the wrong people, and you've just totally wasted your money, and you've left people in the lurch. So you could line people up like a risk model. The highest risk person in our book might be somebody lying in a hospice with ESRD and you know 
tubes coming out of them. There's nothing you're going to do for that person. There's no nurse in the world who's going to intervene and somehow majestically make, make their life better. But you could have somebody who's, who has out of control diabetes, who's in the ER every other week and eating all the wrong things, and there's somebody who might actually intervention. So it's not just, it's not, again, that's, that's making the numbers useful, not just lining up the numbers in terms of their absolute value, but trying to put some intelligence around it. Um, and then we've got our employers and our, our members, our consumers, and they are demanding a lot more information because they're making, they're not just buying insurance anymore, they're buying a wellness program. <laughs> What's a wellness program, right? I mean, nobody knows. There's another one that he's made up here. It's great. I, I, we literally have clients who change what they offer in their cafeteria and believe they have a full-fledged wellness program for point. Maybe they do, I don't know. And then they have other folks who like invest tons of money. Um, uh, I, have, I, have, we have, I have one large client who, who, who is, um, and this is terrific, I mean, yay, I'd love to work there. They give their employees a $50 a month, and this is mom, dad, and the kids, for joining and, and going to, you have to prove you go, to a gym. That's a lovely benefit, that's a terrific benefit. But for goodness sakes, it's a benefit. It's not a. It doesn't. It's not an ROI driving activity. And they came. And they came back to us after doing this for three years and said, "No, mind you, they did this. We can tell them. Prove to us our gym benefit has ROI. I didn't tell you to give people fifty bucks a month. So, amazingly enough, and I have a slide. I'll get there in a second. We actually measured the impact of this, and it had a really positive impact. People who who joined the gyms and went and proved that they went actually had $17, it came out $17 and changed PMPM, decrease in cost over what it would have been and, and the control group was a nightmare, but we, we did a real nice job, I think, of that research. But it's not 50. So I said, you have driven down cost, you have improved the health and the happiness of these members, and I hope you're content giving them this terrific benefit which augments their salary and gets them to go to the gym, but you're never going to drive I mean, 50. Goodness sakes. Um, and then providers, of course, providers. They, they should be the top one. So, um, this is the kind of stuff we do. Not, no, nothing surprising here. We're involved in, in medical management, as I said, you, you know, the, trying to decide which programs we should have and which people should be in them and how to run them and whether they work or not. Because every one of our accounts now wants us to come back with an ROI analysis on everything. Um, program evaluation, like I said, we can't do anything unless it pro provides value. Um, providers in particular, we're, we're asking you to take risk. We better darn well, you know, provide you with a lot of rich information to help, you know, an odometer that's always working, not just once a month or once a quarter or once a year, God help you, but constantly giving you information to know how you're doing. Um, yeah, 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 the rest of it. So I'm trying to, trying to go fast. Um, healthcare reform provides a rich environment for silliness, and it's, it's interesting and exciting. Um, and like I say, we're just trying not to make the same mistakes we made before, because this has got to happen. I mean, I think we can all agree, it's got to happen. To come, what do they say? If nothing changed, the CBO predicts that by 2020, not that long from now, two presidential election cycles from now, uh, the cost of healthcare, the, the percent of GDP sucked up by healthcare will double. Right. Wow, that's, that's an amazing statistic. That means everything else gets thrown out, right? 17% now, I think they're saying, so like 35. So that means, just think about it, more base closures, fewer VA benefits, schools and roads, you know, dilapidated. Um, yeah. So what we're trying to provide um, is information along a number of different parameters. Um, obviously, financial management, so you know how you're tracking against these prepaid, these risk-bearing um, arrangements we have between us, whether it's an ECO or a uh, uh, medical home or patient, whatever it is. Use of resources, cost of resources. Uh, quality management, because quality increasingly matters. It always matters, but it really does matter. You, um, you know, for us at least as a health plan, for example, in our Medicare product, Harvard's getting back into Medicare next year, um, uh, you, you can't get paid unless you can prove, measure, and prove the, that the quality of the care your patients get. There's a stars system, one through five, and three being average, but if you get three stars, you'll actually lose money. And, and lots of people have figured this out. So you have to be really good or else you don't get money. 
Um, and I think the same will be is, is true for providers. And then the patient <coughs> management piece. Um, it's like that wonderful scene in that wonderful Fellini movie where a kid finally gets everything he ever wanted and he looks at it and he says, what do I do with it? Got all these patients getting paid. What do I do with them? So I laid this out. I'm repeating myself. Yeah, see, see, I'm skipping. Okay, so a couple of quick demos and I'll get out of your way. Um, so I wanted to show you, we have this provider dashboard we've built, kind of a nice example of an informatics project. Um, uh, Harvard Pilgrim has these things called LCUs, which is our contracting entities, local care units. They're as big as these enormous healthcare systems, and they're as small as an independent physician practice. So it's, it's the, the entity we contract with, and that's what we produce information for, because that's who took our contracts. Um, and and as, I, as it says, we, we're trying to roll a very rich information stream into this with, and it's online, you can go fetch it yourself, it's all security protected, and, and, and I have to apologize ahead of time, and I mean this quite sincerely, I'm sorry, because getting connected can be difficult. There are like three layers of security, I mean this is PHI at its finest, so our security folks have, have you know, are bent up in knots about this, and, and there are literally three layers of security got through, and, and I've sadly seen providers who have literally taken months before they are hooked up, it, you know, I don't even know what to say about that. Um, but the point is, once you're in, um, and, and I want to, I wanted to show you. That. So, show the project. This is actually a, um, this cool program called Flash. You're not looking at, you're looking at a sort of a, a picture of the real thing, but some of the controls still work. So, um, the the woman who designed this is very, as you can tell, visually oriented. I'm kind of more of a numbers person. I like tables, but, um, I, but I trust her judgment. She said most of the provider groups she works with, they've done all kinds of focus groups and stuff, really like to start with a picture and you can drill down to the tables if you want. Um, but there's some, some cool um, controls here. So you're looking at um, use and cost and little flyovers. Um, think everybody always wants to know, yeah, okay, that's my number, but is it any good? So we give you the uh, Top uh, the 25th top 25th percentile of across our network to compare yourself to it's the red line. So um, you know, this this is a fake group. This is just like took a, a random bunch of docs and, and created a fake LCU out of them, so I didn't violate any, any privacy concerns. Um, you know, so this sort of fake group of docs looks like their cost is going down. It's really nice, but they're still higher than the benchmark. So doing right direction, still a place to go. This is obviously very very summary. We give them information on, on their membership, um, uh, adults versus PD, uh, uh, the amount of care that occurred in the community hospital, primary care, risk management, how sick are your, are your in, are infector patients sicker? In this case, no, 0.8 of one being average. Um, high cost cases, stuff like that. And then they can begin to drill down into this. Um, and, and again, very visual. So it's this, um, they call this a heat map good, if it isn't so good. Um, so you, know, you can see where the, the size of the block is the amount of money in it, the amount of care, the amount of uh, resources, um, and the color being whether it's heading up or heading down. And, and you can flip between these different service categories um, and get a different image. And there's a lot more here, obviously I'm just going very fast. Um, different types of care, I think refreshes, um, didn't allow that drill down. See, the flash doesn't have everything. Um, and then you can get down to lower and lower levels. And, and then the level that is not exposed here in the, in the flash demo is when you get to real low level of detail by DRG, by provider, by patient, by event, by encounter. So, like I say, um, user defined, active drill down. These are refreshed monthly. So we're, we're we're getting a lot of traction on this. Um, we also, just one last thing I want to show you, we built this little dashboard for ourselves as well. This is internal, y'all can't have this, sorry. But um, it's actually got very similar information with a little bit more of a mindset of internal of health plan management, um, where we have all the different types of care, the medical broken down into its glorious bits, uh, behavioral, drug, 
Um, and, and these just drill down, as I say, all the way, they just keep going down, down, down until they get to the individual member and the individual claim line. But this is all about identifying um, where we need to do something, a little red and green arrow device. Um, when I first got that, um, uh, I worked for a, a very, very large national payer and um, uh, had 16 different uh, products, I mean, geographic regions. And it was, you know, the result of a multiple mergers over time. And um, our medical director there, great guy actually, from, from the East Coast, uh, asked if he could just see a, a, what he thought was a fairly simple statistic, the length of stay for cabbage. Okay, at, you know, the thousands of hospitals we had, or at least, he said, just even average by state. So it took about a month, but he, he got a report. And, and he said, okay, great, so, so this, is the, this is the length of stay for cabbage in each of states. Well, yeah, kind of. What do you mean, well, yeah, kind of? Well, we don't know whether everybody did it the same or used the same input data or used the same algorithm or used the same logic or, you know, excluded and included the same. So we had garbage. Um, and and even, even a plant the size of Harvard Pilgrim, it's possible to have it. There's a lot of brilliant analysts. I asked three of them the same question. I'm making three analysts. They're all brilliant. They're all doing the right thing. They're all geniuses. They all know our data warehouse better than anybody. Standards kind of matter. And hopefully they're the right standards. So we, you know, we have a we have a series of metrics here. You pick your metric, you get your answer. Um, so if I say services per thousand, it means the same thing every time you go into the application. Doesn't matter if I ask Fred or Mary or Joe or you know Brunhilde to run the program for me, I get the same answer. And then we also have a view here clinically. This is that episodes of care notion again. So I have a kind of a fun, typical financial breakdown, but also not by condition. You know, what does it cost? Not just the length of stay for cabbage at the hospital, what does it cost to take care of a patient who needed a cabbage over time? Because there are different kinds of opportunities we discover. <coughs> so we're done. Um, I just have some screenshots of things. That's our ROI analysis I talked about, the gym, the gym benefit. Um, dashboards you just saw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Last thing I just want to note, just, you know, it's always important to keep in mind, it's, it's building the case for what you do at work. It's terribly important. So what we have here is a bunch of Vikings working on this catapult. Note the guy in the corner. He says, I told you guys to slow down and take it easy or something like this would happen. So my point being, obviously, <laughs> That these transitions can be rough, and um, it, you got you know sometimes it, it, it being sensitive because boy we ruffle a lot of feathers. So there, I, literally as I walk down the hallway of our office, I get stopped by people who, I'm, I mean from one day to the next it'll be we are so glad you're here, and the next day it's you know we've been doing this for years. <laughs> so a little try to be as insensitive as I can. This is the classic Larson right Midvale School for the gifted. Pull. Doesn't matter how smart we are, and we're all probably fairly smart people if we're in this room. You know, there's still better ways to do things, and it, and, and and get into ruts, right? You, you know, you just you, you're you're sure you've always done it that way. Does not mean it's right. When we when we develop, for example, a new predictive model, the hilarious thing is I always have to go back and prove to the folks who are going to use it that it matches what they had before. Which is the most perverse demand I can imagine, but that's always what we have to do. Well, well, it better tie off. No, see, that, the whole point is that this is, this is going to give you a different answer. I love this one. Whoa, that was a good one. Try it, huh? Just poke his brain right where my finger is. <laughs> even, even the dots. <laughs> and finally, idiosyncratic, poorly documented and manual processes can lead to rework. Note, this is where they're digging a moat. Suddenly, <laughs> suddenly a heated exchange took place between the king and the moat contractor. <laughs> that is all I have. I hope you enjoy that. We've got time for questions. Yeah, a question for you. Please. In the uh, example of the provider dashboard, yeah. can you talk at all about what your experience has been of getting providers to adopt that? Oh, that's, that is a great question. Um, uh, the experience 
for adoption around the provider dashboard. So I'm going to answer it in two different ways. Um, just first adoption in general, and then the provider <coughs> dashboard. So I actually, I, like I said, a 17 person staff. It's, it's a very small staff. Um, and I um, actually have devoted two entire people to nothing but adoption. Their job is adoption. Their job is proselytizing. They're, they go around people's desks and go, so are you using the new dashboard? And if you're not, how come? And gee, you're one of the people who asked us to build it. So I noticed you're still running those SaaS programs. And I mean, it's not quite that, that in your face, but it pretty much is. And uh, I measured, my own performance is heavily measured on adoption. And I did that on purpose. I asked my boss to do that on purpose. Because if we build the stuff and nobody uses it, that's dumb. Fire me and save some money. Um, uh, so so adoption is really hard, first of all. Because it means migrating off of what you're used to and the whole comfort zone thing. Provider dashboard specifically, um, and I'm going to ignore for the moment my own my own uh, mea culpa about um, the uh, the challenges of getting hooked up because of security issues. But um, the good news is that's not as hard. I'll, I'll tell you why. Because since our relationship tends to be with these LCUs, these contracting entities, um, they almost universally have practice managers, administrators. Those are the people who log in go crazy and go, Dr. Smith, this is what I found. Stop giving everybody an MRI when you walk through the door. So I don't know how many actual physicians sign in, but actually a fair number. But by and large, it tends to be the practice administrators. And they get, they get, in fact, they get, some of them get so aggressive about this. We have a couple places with some of these really big, really sophisticated systems where they don't even want the dashboard, they want the data under it, that they integrate into their brilliant system that they've spent years and years building. So, but it's, it's mixed, definitely. What, what, what were you thinking when you asked that question? I was thinking that most providers have, um, have multiple payers that they're involved with. You know, their, their panel of patients represents a dozen or more payers. Yes. So it's only that subset of payers that are that are using you know, your health plan that really are, are, have this dashboard be relevant to them. Yeah. No. You, that is one of those agonizingly true points. The point was that providers have a whole bunch of payers, and they're getting different information from each of them. And so we have this sort of unwinnable situation where each payer knows everything about their members. Each provider knows everything about the people they serve, but not the other providers they saw. I mean, because unless, unless they're in a captive environment, any one of your patients could wander across the street and do whatever they want. So we're the only ones with a longitudinal, complete view of our members, but only of our members. You have a complete view of the care you gave across pairs, but not complete for each member. Uh, um, the APCDs, the devs of the world, thank you, devs, stop believing. Um, are trying to correct this by merging all of the data and, and providing uh, analytic services around them. And, and God bless them because we need that. Um, yeah. Again, if if there was somebody who we could partner with who could create a, all the appropriate metrics across payers, we'd stop doing that. But right now, our our providers, I mean, we're we're a fairly hefty chunk of the business of many providers and. They're glad to get the information. Somebody over here. Yes. Have you found that among the expense of non-compliant patients is better to concentrate with those influenced by an employer versus those who are out of the workforce and on the public dollar and there's nothing you can do to them if they're non-compliant? That, I mean, in some respects is a question perhaps more aptly put to, to providers. Um, as a health plan, and, and right now Harvard Pilgrim is almost entirely commercial. So we don't, we don't have a lot of Medicaid business. We have in the past. Um, obviously, the health plan, you might, in you know, a funny sort of way, has to care equally about all of its members because each one of them drives their own little chunk of revenue. Um, and I guess the only intelligent answer to your question is there are very different levers you have to pull depending on the product line. And I've worked in Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial. And it's astoundingly different the way you manage those three populations. In fact, fact Harvard Pilgrim, as I said, is getting back into Medicare next year. We're, we, we're uh, getting back into Medicare Advantage. We've always done Medicare RAP, but that's kind of another thing. Um, and, uh, and 
and I mean this in only the nicest way, the naivety of some of my colleagues around, oh yeah, it's just another product line. I'm like, no, it's really not just another product line. Um, but luckily we brought in um, uh, some external partners. I think we're doing a nice job of it. But you, I mean, so it's, it's sort of a bland response, but a completely different level as you call to influence the behavior of different populations. Else? Your patient. Thank <laughs> you.